My dad drove a coal truck and he got paid by the ton. He said, when coal was moving, we drove hard, we drove heavy. <laughs> um, and when the coal wasn't moving, you didn't get paid. So it was tough. I, I grew up in a poor community. But my parents loved Jesus, and they lived it out. And so, you know, here I was blessed to have parents who taught me the Word of God and taught my siblings, taught the neighborhood kids. They taught us the gospel. They've been with the Lord now for a number of years. But I heard the gospel from my parents. I've been able to pass it on to my kids, who in turn are passing it on to their kids. But we want my grandkids to learn the gospel, believe the gospel, in a way that when they're parents, they're going to be teaching it to their kids. When we were raising our kids, occasionally I'd, we'd run into someone and say, oh, you guys do such a good job with your kids. I developed a, a standard answer when people said that. I said, why don't you wait to see how our kids raise their kids? Thank you so much for your encouragement, but why don't you withhold judgment until you see how our kids raise their kids? Because that transfer of the baton is where you're going to see your encouragement. <laughs> and so our kids are teaching their kids the gospel of Jesus Christ. But I want to see what my grandkids do when they become parents. And I doubt I'll live long enough to see the generation after that. But if I would, um, wouldn't that be a blessing to see my great, great grandkids following the Lord? Um, yeah, you see in Psalm 78 this very intentional um, passing of the baton from generation to generation to generation. And even though this is Old Testament, there's so many parallels for us. And we can read more of this psalm, and we will. And as you read this psalm, we already read, what was it, uh, 7 and 8, where it says, not forget the works of the Lord, the works of God, like their fathers, a stubborn and rebellious generation. I think it was John Piper was uh, preaching on the psalm one time. I was reading a transcript of his sermon, and he said, this psalm can be really discouraging because <laughs> you read this psalm, and it's long, and Asaph recounts how many times, how many times did the children of Israel disbelieve God how often did the children of Israel just disobey God? And John Piper saying, you know, you read the psalm and it can be so discouraging. But as you read it, the astonishing thing is, is how gracious and how patient God is. And we can't read this psalm and, and look at the Israelites in Moses' era and say, I can't believe those people. How in the world could they do that? Because you know why we shouldn't be saying that? Why shouldn't we be saying that? Because we do the same thing, or we could do the same thing. I wasn't planning on telling you the story, but I will. But years ago, well, 10 years ago now maybe, probably one of the more shocking experiences I had as a pastor was a lady in our church who everyone thought of as a godly lady, um, she seemed to be one of my wife's closest friends. As couples, we were close. The husband had a migraine headache one day and came home and found his wife in bed with another man. And I had to go home. The husband talked to me immediately. I mean, he called me and says, can you come and talk to me? I want to kill this guy. And uh, thankfully, he didn't. But then I had to go home and tell my wife about her friend. And um, I remember being so grieved. I was angry. And I remember thinking, I remember thinking, how could she do that? And when that thought went through my mind, I don't have a lot of epiphanies in my experience. I, I'm not a real touchy-feely kind of guy. But I had an epiphany. Now, when I had that thought, how could she do that? It was like the Holy Spirit. I'm not saying he spoke to me audibly. But it was like the Holy Spirit said to me, who do you think you are? 
I felt the rebuke of the Holy Spirit in my heart immediately after thinking, how in the world could she do that? Who do you think you are? And I think the Spirit was reminding me that I am just as susceptible to sin as anybody else, that I'm not above sinning. And it's only God's grace that keeps me from sinning. It's only God's grace that kept me from sinning like that. And it was, I, it, that shook me up. I, I was shaking. I remember holding my wife's hand in bed all night long. And I've, I've wondered at times, why was I holding her hand all night? I think I was scared. I, I didn't want to let go of my wife. I don't want to let go of her. You know, just that, that brokenness in my heart, my own pride. And we read Psalm 78 and we see how the children of Israel many of whom were not converted. There's a difference if we are converted. But how many of them saw the grace of God and just blew it off? They just believed it. But <clears throat> we're going to read Psalm 78 in bites, and we want to look at it for our heart's sake, but then also think, okay, how does this relate to raising kids or influencing grandkids, okay? So Psalm 78, we said already those first eight verses, we saw about five generations there. If you look at it, just keep your Bible open. We're going to look at it again and again and again. When, when he says, I'm looking for the exact word here, in verse 5 he says, He established a testimony in Jacob and appointed a law in Israel, which he commanded our fathers to teach to their children. So Asaph's referring to what when he says a testimony, laws? What's he referring to there? It's not a trick question, by the way. He's talking about the Word of God. Um, he's saying the Israelites had the Word of God. Now, they didn't have the whole Word of God that we have now, but what books of the Bible would they have had eventually? They would have had what books of the Bible? First five. First five. Thank you, BJ. Yeah, the books of Moses. Uh, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. That was their Bible until the other books were written over the course of hundreds of years. But in Moses' era, uh, the Lord used Moses to write the first five books, the books of Moses. Um, <clears throat> and so that's the Bible they had. So when Asaph said, our fathers were given a testimony, they were given the laws of God, he's saying they had the written word of God. They had the Bible, at least they're part of the Bible that had already been written. So he's saying that God's people have the word of God. Now, let's extrapolate to our era. We have the Word of God, don't we? Only we don't just have five books. We have 66. <laughs> we have everything from Genesis to Revelation. We have the whole Bible. God's given us the Word of God. Now, according to Psalm 78, what are we supposed to do with the Word of God? We're supposed to pass it down. Now, I realize here at Trinity Baptist, not this probably isn't a problem. This probably isn't an issue. But you probably work with people or have relatives who think of the Bible as like a good luck charm, right? I mean, it's, it's, it's kind of a, a good luck charm or something, you know. Um, they don't read it, but, you know, they think it, it's a holy book, you know. And, and uh, they talk about it maybe with some sort of respect. That's getting lost in our generation, but there are still people who think of the Bible as... Um, a holy book, and it's good to have one on the coffee table and to look religious, whatever. But the Word of God wasn't given to us just to let it sit there. It was given to us not only to read, but to pass on, to pass on to the coming generations. That's what the Word of God says here. It says that we are to give it to the next generation. That, verse 6 that the next generation might know them, the children yet unborn. So we're supposed to be telling them the word of God. Now, to bring some gospel application here to an Old Testament context, um, when, when Asaph is talking about the testimony of the Lord, the law of the Lord, he's probably not talking just in generalities of Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, but he's probably thinking and writing more specifically about not only the book of Exodus, but the part of Exodus that's known as the book of the covenant. 
and in particular the Ten Commandments, which are kind of a summary of the Old Testament law. And so Asaph is saying, we are supposed to take this testimony, this law that God's given us, and pass it on to the next generation. Okay, he's saying, but we don't live in the Old Testament, and I agree. Um, but let me ask you a question. How do the Ten Commandments start? Um, do they start with, do this? Well, I'll tell you what, if you don't remember, just keep your finger in Psalm 78, but flip back to Exodus 20. That's where the Ten Commandments are. Uh, Exodus 20. And someone, help me preserve my voice, if you will. I don't know why I'm struggling here tonight, but someone read the first two verses of Exodus 20. I'm a volunteer to do that. God spoke all these words, saying, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of the city. Okay, think, think about what Bill just read there. How do the Ten Commandments start? Put it in your words. How, how do the Ten Commandments start? With what we're supposed to do? The Ten Commandments start with what God already did. God says, this is what I've done for you. And you read the book of Exodus in particular, but really the whole Pentateuch, and, and there is this theme of redemption out of Egypt, that Egypt is seen as you know this dark place of slavery. And God in his kindness brought Israel out as his son, speaking collectively as his son, he brought his son out of slavery. He says, this is what I've done for you. Now, in light of what I've done for you, have no other gods before me. And, and that's when you read the Ten Commandments. When we talk about giving the word of God to our kids and grandkids, to me, this is something I missed for a number of years. And, and I, I want to, I would like you to learn from my mistakes. Gladine and I, my wife and I, were talking just recently how the church we grew up in, and we're thankful for the church we grew up in. I'm not dissing the church we grew up in. Um, but it was not, it was a church that held to the Bible, but there wasn't a lot of thought given to the theme of the Bible. The Bible was looked upon as more a collection of Bible verses. You know, so the Bible says, don't do this, so don't do it. Just don't do it, Paul. You know, and, and, and you're supposed to be a good person, Veronica. Be, be a good person. You know, and that's kind of how we were raised that in our church. Is, it was kind of rules. Some rules had to do with not doing things, and some rules had to do with doing things. And, and we're supposed to be good Christians. And we have Bible verses to back that up. You know, good Christians don't do that. Good Christians do this. So don't do that. Do this. And that was kind of the way we grew up. And you know what? Most of the kids I grew up with in our church are not following the Lord today. I'm not blaming the church, but I've thought different times, oh, wouldn't it have been better if there had been more attention given to this is what God has done. Therefore, do this. Therefore, don't do that in light of who he is, in light of what he has done. So even think about it as a, a New Testament, a new covenant believer. Here, Exodus 20, verse 2 says, I brought you by the hand out of Egypt. I brought you out of slavery. Therefore, have no other gods. So here we are as new covenant believers. We're not in that era. We're in this era. But God says, I'm the one who bought you out of slavery. It's almost the same words. He says, I transfer you out of the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of the son whom I love. I, I'm the one who redeemed you. I, I brought you out of slavery. I, I gave my son to redeem you. Therefore, do this. Therefore, don't do that. And I think as we raise kids and as we influence our grandkids, to keep this gospel culture, this gospel atmosphere in not only what we say, but how we say it. 
that we emphasize the gospel as we call upon our kids and grandkids to follow Christ. Um, how many of you just loved high school English class? <laughs> yes, a couple. <laughs> I always liked English. Sorry. I'm speaking good or English all the time. Too. <laughs> um, what's an imperative? What's an imperative? It's a command. An imperative is a command. Do this. Don't do that. That's an imperative. What's an indicative? An indicative. An indicative is a statement of fact. It's, you're just indicating something. You're, you're just stating a fact. It's an indicative. The commands of the Bible, the imperatives of the Bible, are never given to us naked. They're never given to us naked. You, you don't see imperatives in the Bible detached from the indicatives. Now, if, if, you, if you hated English, stick with me, please. The imperatives of the Bible never show up naked. They're always clothed in the indicative. The commands in the Bible are always solidly based on the indicatives of who God is, always solidly based on the indicatives of what God has done. This is what God has done for you. Is that important? Okay. Let me give you some illustrations that you're probably familiar with if you're a Bible reader. <clears throat> I'll tell you what. Let's, I, I, this isn't in your lesson. Oh, by the way, we had handouts. I forgot to hand them out. There are some of you note takers. Ah, they're sitting here. I just saw them. If you want to take notes, I'll tell you what. Someone want to pass these out? If you both take notes, thanks, Bill. I'm departing from my notes when I say this. Oh. Let's relate this to how we talk to our kids and grandkids. Do you guys want to take a break? I heard there's cookies down the hallway. Let me, let me walk you through this, and then we'll take a break and see if the kids left us any cookies, okay? Ephesians. Let's look at Ephesians. How about halfway through the book of Ephesians, chapter 4? I'm sorry. Here, I've been talking for 40 minutes, and just now I remember the outline. And I'll have them next two nights as well. Who has a Bible open to Ephesians 4 and wants to read the first oh, three verses, we'll say. You know, you know what? Let's just stop right there. Read that again. That is powerful. Just that is so powerful. I think that's enough. So read that just that much again. Okay. What's the first word she read there? Therefore. When you see a therefore, you always want to stop and ask what it's there for. <laughs> you see a therefore in the Bible or a then. Or a connecting word like that, you always want to back up and say, okay, why is that there? Why is that then there? Why is that therefore there? And so chapter 4 says, therefore, what are the first, God, I'm depending on you to have some familiarity with the book of Ephesians. And if you don't, don't feel bad because we all are in process of learning. But if you are familiar with the flow of the book of Ephesians, what are the first few chapters of Ephesians about? About chapter 1. Let me just get you started. It says, Thanks be to God who has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. In love, he predestined us to be adopted as his son. What? It's on, it's on redemption. Do you know how many commands there are in the first three chapters of Ephesians? I think there's one. I, I'm going from memory now, but I think there's one imperative in three chapters. There's one imperative in three old chapters, one command. 
And so Paul is just going out of his way to say, look at what God has done for us. Look at all these indicatives. Look at what God has done, these statements of fact. God has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. In love, he predestined us to be adopted as his sons. And he goes on and on and on like that. And, and you think, oh, that's kind of like what he told the Israelites. I led you by the hand out of Egypt. He's telling us what he's done for us. And then you get to chapter 4, 5, and 6. And you start seeing all these imperatives. You start seeing all these commands. We were talking about this book a few minutes ago, Loving Your Wife as Christ Loves the Church. You know where that came from. Ephesians 5. Ephesians 5, verse 25. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. And so here's the Apostle Paul talking to us married men. And he doesn't say, love your wife. Love your wife. Now, it does say that, but you tell, you tell part of the truth as, as if it's the whole truth, it becomes an untruth. That's not the whole truth. It doesn't only say love your wife. It says love your wife as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. Paul's saying there, husbands, the imperative of loving your wife is solidly founded on the indicative of what Christ has done for us. He's, he's loved us, and he's given himself. He Literally, Paul says there, he gave himself over for us. He gave himself over as a sacrifice on our behalf. Now, husbands, in light of what Christ has done for you, do you see what Christ has done for you? He sacrificed his life to redeem you. Now, husband, you love your wife in a sacrificial way. The imperative is clothed in the indicative. The command to love your wife is clothed in the indicative of how much Christ loves you and gave himself up for you and me. Wives, submit to your husbands. One of you ladies tell me how it ends. Wives, submit to your husbands as... Verse 22... As unto the Lord. You see what Paul's doing here? He's saying, ladies, think about the Lord. Think about all he's done for you. Now, honor your husband this way. Support his leadership that way. Look at what he's done for you. Children, obey your parents as... Chapter 6. Children, obey your parents. What's it say? You can look if you don't remember. Chapter 6, verse 1, children obey your parents. Obey your parents. In the Lord. You hear what Linda said there? Children obey your parents in the Lord. And so Paul's doing it again, even with kids, even with kids in the church. Your kids, our grandkids. You don't say, obey your parents. Well, I'm your dad, that's why you should listen to me. You better obey me, I'm your mom. You see what we're doing there? We're not applying the gospel. The gospel is not shaping our words to our kids when we do that. We're treating the imperatives as if they're naked. They're not attached to anything, not founded on anything. You better listen to me. I'm your dad. You better listen to me. I'm your mom. That's not gospel. But if you say, son, daughter, Christ has treated us with his mercy. And I'm his son. I'm his daughter. And he's treated me with mercy. And he wants you to follow my leadership. He wants you to obey my voice because of who he is and what he has done. And we take our kids and we go vertical with them. And we talk to them as a recipient of grace, as children who need his grace. We point to the Lord. You can see that over and over. I'll do one more of these with you and then we'll go get cookies. Anybody remember how Romans 12 starts? Well, let's look. What we're looking for here is how does the gospel shape our parenting, our grandparenting? How does Romans 12 start? Oh, there's a therefore. Okay. Tell you what, Paul. Why don't you just read the first sentence? 12.1. 
Romans. Okay, so you're going to call your kids son, daughter, grandson, granddaughter. I'm calling you to live for Christ. I want you to present yourself as a living sacrifice to Christ. But, but that's not all it says there. That's just part of it. What, what's the rest of it? In view of in view of God's mercies. What mercies? What mercies, Paul? What mercies are you talking about? The first 11 chapters. The first 11 chapters. Paul has gone out of his way for 11 chapters to pour out the mercies of God. Look at the mercies of God. Chapter after chapter talking about the mercies of God. Look at what God has done for you. I'm not ashamed of the gospel. It's the power of God. The salvation to all who believe. It was, it was God's patience that led you to repentance. Chapter 2. That we were lost in our sins. All of us fall short of the glory of God. And yet he showed us his grace. Chapter 3. And you can walk through chapter after chapter after chapter after chapter of Romans 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, chapter 12. Therefore, in view of God's mercies, plural, in view of God's mercies, present your bodies as a living sacrifice. And he's, he's not just putting a little touch of gospel on that. He's not just putting a little bit of indicative on that imperative. He's, he's dumping it on. He says, in view of all these mercies we've been talking about for 11 chapters, present your body as a living sacrifice. And so we want to see that. We want that to be the, the, the paradigm, the framework by which we look at our lives. Why, why should I, why, why should I, as a professing Christian, dedicate my life dedicate my body to Christ, to live for him. Why, why should I do that? That's awfully costly, isn't it? I mean, being a sacrifice is a costly endeavor. Why should I be willing to let go of everything else so I can hold on to Christ? Why, why would I want to do that? What, what would motivate me to want to die to self and follow Christ? Is it a naked imperative? It's not naked at all, is it? It's clothed. It's clothed in the indicatives of his mercies, in view of his mercies, in view of his mercies. Give yourself over to him. Dedicate your bodies as a living sacrifice. Now, see, we have to start with us as parents and grandparents. Do I understand how the gospel shapes my Christian life? That my Christian life isn't just a list of do's and don'ts. There are do's and don'ts. There are, there are imperatives. But those imperatives are always clothed in the indicatives. Those imperatives, those commands, are always founded on, based on, solidly based on, the indicatives of God's grace. Israel, I took you by the hand and led you out of slavery in Egypt. Therefore, have no other gods before me. In view of God's mercy. Present your bodies as a living sacrifice. Therefore, brothers, walk worthy of the calling. The first three chapters of Ephesians, walk worthy of the calling that you've received. Now, see, if we think that way, in a growing way, I realize we're all growing. But if we train our minds by the Spirit's empowerment to see how the gospel shapes my life, that I want to live whole, all out for Christ, but that's not just a do it sort of thing, the old Nike commercial, you know, just do it. It's not a just do it. It's in view of his mercies, in view of his mercies. Now, that begins to shape how I think. That begins to shape how I feel about things. That begins to shape what I talk about. So I'm interacting with my kids. I'm interacting with my grandkids. What's going to come out? What's going to come out? The gospel. And the gospel isn't just John 3.16. The gospel's all through the Bible, even in Exodus 20. The gospel's all through the Bible. This is what God has done through Christ. We look forward to Christ. We look back on Christ. But think about 
all of his mercies. Think about all what Christ has done for you. So we talk to our kids and grandkids that way. We're, we're telling them the testimony, Psalm 78. I'm way off my outline, and I don't care. <laughs> Tell you what, let's see if the kids left any cookies, right? The kids, the hallway, I heard uh, Anthony said, check out the hallway. We'll give you 10 minutes if you need to stretch, use the bathroom, get a cookie, get some water. And we'll, we'll kind of walk through Psalm 78 some more. I will. I want to. Aaron, okay. where at? Uh, I'm going. I'm just. Where Where'd you get back from? Uh, we're here on we're on the steps from uh, Zambia, Lusaka. Zambia in Lusaka. Uh -huh. Yeah, got some friends in Lusaka. Uh, well, Conrad and Bayway, oh, yeah. Reformed Conrad. Baptist brother, and uh, one of my uh, friends I haven't seen in years now is Joseph Fukwe. I think he's up in Ndola now, though, actually. So what, what takes you to Lusaka? What do you do in Lusaka? Uh, we teach at the Baptist Seminary there. Yeah. So. What's the name of the seminary? Is it uh, the Af Baptist Theological Seminary in okay. Zambia. Okay, there's that one. There's African Christian University. And then up in Ndola. Now there's uh, Copper Bell or something. Uh, SB. SBC. Okay. So what do you teach? Well, right now I'm not teaching. Um, <laughs> of course, we're here, but um, I did teach... Um, Women ministry, Brother yeah. Ruth, children's ministry, uh, foundations of faith. Um, just depends on what. I hear good things about the church in Zambia. Are you encouraged by what you're seeing there? Yes, no. I mean, that, there's some really hard things mm -hmm. there. Um, the church is very shallow. Is it? Um, and um, on the surface, things look, you know, look pretty mm -hmm. good, but. There's uh, a lot of syncretism going on. Yeah. Things that we're trying to, you know, that we're Aaron, it's good to meet you tonight, too. He's getting ready to go to Japan. Japan. Oh, there's a needy country. Oh, great. I'm glad I got to meet you tonight. Let's check out the cookies. I have huh? to laugh when Veronica uh, made the comment about the girls. We have four boys in the week. Had girls, had two girls, but anyway, it's like with boys, it's just buck up. Yeah. But the girls just look at them and start crying. That's right. You got to be so it's tender. So different. Yes. Yeah, it's a challenge. It's sure. Yeah. Well, I was talking to one of my older granddaughters the other day. She's ten, mm -hmm. but I think she's going to blossom a little early. And um, I know. Oh, here we go again. <laughs> Let me turn this off. Biological daughter that we lost very young, and oh, then right. uh, we decided to adopt a little girl.
Well, thanks. No, thanks. I'm fine. You eat that. So is this for breakfast, Tony? I mean, thanks for taking care of me. Debating how to handle the rest of our time together here to know what would be most helpful to you. I was going to walk through Psalm 78. I announced I would do that, but I wonder if uh, maybe we ought to just kind of get a 30,000 foot overview of uh, Psalm 78 and then talk more about application. I think talking about the application might be even more beneficial. But uh, here, ASAP is talking to, he's teaching the people of Israel that God gave us his word. It was a written word. God gave us his written word, a law, a testimony, he calls it. He said, um, and we're supposed to pass this on to our children, that the word of God was not merely to benefit us, but he's calling on us to believe the gospel, to believe the word of God, but then to pass it on to the next generation so they could pass it on to the next generation so they could pass it on to the next generation. And you see this pattern in Psalm 78. When you read Psalm 78, Asaph is wanting the, the parents, we'll call them the parents of Israel, to teach your kids the mistakes of the past. I think it was Edmund Burke, a British philosopher, 17th, 18th century, who said, those who forget history are doomed to repeat it, they're destined to repeat it. Yeah, Edmund Burke. Uh, British philosopher. You know, there's a lot of wisdom in that statement, isn't there? Uh, if we forget our history, it's easy to repeat the mistakes of the past. And so it's fascinating what he does in Psalm 78. To think about this, he's writing this poem, this parable, um, and people would actually memorize this. I mean, it'd be like us saying, do you, do you want to sing four or five verses of Amazing Grace? There's a number of you here in the room that if we got started you could probably sing four or five verses of Amazing Grace. It's, it's just up there. You've heard it enough. Well, the people of Israel would have heard Psalm 78 enough that they could probably recite it in Hebrew nonetheless. <laughs> yeah. uh, but here they would know it so well. And so Asaph says, parents, teach your kids the mistakes of people in the past and teach them God's grace. And so you see this pattern. So what we're looking for here is a pattern, even if we don't remember all the particulars, to see this pattern that when we talk to our kids and our grandkids, that we're teaching them the ways of God. We're teaching we're sinners, just like our ancestors were sinners, and God is gracious. He's been gracious to our spiritual ancestors. He's gracious to us. And so we're teaching them that pattern. We're not just saying, be good people, but we're saying, you're not a good person, neither am I. Um, we're sinners in need of God's grace. But look at how gracious he is. So teach your kids these things so they can teach their kids these things so they can teach their kids these things. Uh, let me just read 12 through 16, and I'm just going to get an overview here. In the sight of their fathers, he performed wonders in the land of Egypt and the fields of Zoan. He divided the sea and let them pass through it. He made the water stand like a heap. And you could read more of this, but 
It's interesting what Asaph is saying, teach your kids these things. This is the spiritual heritage of these Israelite kids. He said their ancestors saw the hand of God in Zoan. Now, I had to do some research on that because that name didn't mean a whole lot to me. And so what I found out was Zoan is just another name for Tanis, which is the city that was kind of the central hub of where the Hebrews lived in the 400 years of captivity. Um, if you remember when Jacob and his sons went down and met with Joseph when Joseph was like second in command of Egypt, the Pharaoh told the Israelites, you can settle up in the Delta. Now, the Delta would have been some of the best pasture land because it was well watered. So if you remember maps from geography class in high school, whatever, you know, the Nile flows from the south north, starts way down at Lake Victoria, flows all the way to the Mediterranean. And Egypt is a dry country. It doesn't rain much there. But because the river flows through it, the river that starts in South Africa, um, that river waters the, the areas alongside it. You get up to the delta and all those fingers go out toward the sea. And that area, the delta, the Nile Delta is very green, very grassy, great place to raise sheep and goats. That's where the people lived. And so Asaph, it says, tell your kids about Zoan. Tell your kids, and you say, well, that doesn't mean a lot to us, but it would mean something to them. What he means is, tell, tell your kids how God sent the plagues on the Egyptians. And when your ancestors lived in Zoan, <coughs> they actually saw the hand of God. They saw the hand of God bringing the plagues on their oppressors. And if you read Psalm 78, he actually recounts some of those. So he's saying the children of Israel, our ancestors, <coughs> they saw the hand of God. They saw the hand of God bringing plagues upon the Egyptians until on the 10th plague, they were finally released from their bondage of slavery. He says they saw the waters divided. What's he talking about there? The Red Sea, crossing the Red Sea. And he's saying, teach your kids these lessons. Teach your kids these stories of the amazing things God has done to his people. Now, that was their story. We might have other stories we want to tell, too, from our era. But it's fascinating how he says, these people actually saw all these amazing things God did. So how did the people respond? Look at verse 17. Yet they sinned still more against him, rebelling against the Most High in the desert. They tested God in their heart by demanding the food they craved. They spoke against God, saying, Can God spread a table in the wilderness? He struck the rock so the water gushed out. The streams overflowed. Can he give bread to provide meat for the people? And he says, Parents, you need to remind your kids that we're sinners. Your ancestors were sinners. God did these amazing things. He freed them from bondage through the plagues. He divided the Red Sea. Now he talks about, <clears throat> he brought water out of the rock. Remember when he did that? He did that twice, actually. Remember when he brought water out of the rock? And he says, tell them those stories. Make sure they don't forget. Tell your kids, tell your kids the word of God. <coughs> How did the people respond? How did the people respond back in the wilderness era? They rebelled. They complained. You, you look at their hearts. And Asaph makes a point that the ancestors, they disbelieved God. Lack of faith is a sin. Disbelieving God is a sin. It's interesting how the author of Hebrews talks about that. In Hebrews chapter 3, verse 12 and 13, he says, Beware lest any one of you be overtaken by a sinful, unbelieving heart. Beware lest any one of you be overtaken by a sinful heart unbelieving heart. He says, those children of Israel, even though, even though they saw this mighty hand of God sending the plagues, dividing the Red Sea, bringing water out of the rock, they go, ah, ah, ah. and they disbelieved God. Their, their hearts were bad. Their words were bad. No, he, okay. He, he got water out of the rock. Well, can he give us some meat? You know, just ungrateful. You listen to those words. Their actions were bad. They were rebelling against God. They, they did the golden calf thing, you know. And, and it's interesting how the, children, the little kids in Israel weren't supposed to be re 
protected from these stories, they were supposed to be told these stories. In other words, we need to talk to the kids about sin. And we need to talk to the kids about sin as fellow sinners. I, I have regrets of times that I've talked to my kids when they were growing up as if I weren't a guilty sinner myself. Why in the world would you do that? I can't believe you would do that. Just stop it. You know, talking to them as if I would never do what you just did. Well, maybe when my parents were living, they should have gone talk to my parents. Maybe, maybe, I, did, maybe I did that very thing. You know, but so often we talk to our kids as if we're not sinners. And if they sin, we act incredulous, like, how in the world could you do that? But we talk to our kids as fellow sinners. And so we're talking to them about the, the greatness of God. We're talking to them about our sin. That This happened recently, talking to one of the grandkids. I forget what the issue was. But I was talking to one of the grandkids who just got angry, I think it was. And, and I said, you know, buddy, Sometimes Papa loses his cool too, don't I? Sometimes I sin and I get angry. I got angry with our seven-year-old grandson not too long ago. I had to go and ask his forgiveness. Boy, did he defy me. <laughs> and I didn't respond in a graceful way. I didn't respond in a gospel-centered way. I just got angry and was done. Do you want to walk home? <laughs> you know, you know, I just upset with him, I had to go and ask his forgiveness. But see, to talk to the children saying, you need Christ, you need forgiveness, you need the gospel, and so do I. We need, we need the gospel, don't we? And we talk them that way. That becomes the gospel-centered culture in which we live as families. That we live as families, as people who are just like the children of Israel. They need God's grace. God's done amazing things. But we're sinners, and God is gracious. And you continue to read in the psalm, and Asaph talks about God's ongoing patience. And you could jump ahead, maybe for sake of time, we ought to just jump down toward the end of this psalm. And um, if you read verses 67 to 72, it says, He rejected the tent of Joseph and did not choose the tribe of Ephraim. Now, I'm going to test your Old Testament history here. Um, he did not choose the tribe of Ephraim, but he chose the tribe of Judah. Okay, what's going on here? What, what's that talking about? The northern tribe, southern tribe, Ephraim would be northern tribes. Ephraim would be one of the bigger tribes, so it kind of stood for all the north. Remember the northern tribes that broke away? Those ten tribes got taken captive long before the southern tribe. And so the northern tribes, God rejected. He chose Judah instead, the southern tribe. Mount Zion, which he loves, he built a sanctuary like the high heavens. By the way, Mount Zion would be Jerusalem. That's in the south. Like the earth, which he has founded forever. He chose David, his servant, and took him from the sheepfolds. From following the nursing ewes, he brought him to shepherd Jacob, his people, Israel, his inheritance. With upright heart, he shepherded them and guided them with his skillful hand. Friends, if we read this about God rejected the north, he chose Judah instead, he rejected Shiloh, where the tabernacle had been, where the Ark of the Covenant had been, and instead chose Mount Zion, Jerusalem, God's making choices. He's saying these people rebelled, never repented. I'm going here, I'm going there. And then he talks about David. It talks about David. And we have to read this through our New Testament lenses. And you read this passage through our New Testament eyes, and you start remembering passages like in Ezekiel, where God says, I'm going to send David, um, and he will be a shepherd forever. And God's speaking figuratively. He's not talking about David being brought up out of the grave and sitting back on the throne, but he's talking about Jesus. And so you read this about God choosing a shepherd for Israel. And you remember what Jesus said in John 10? I am the good shepherd. And the lights start coming on. You go, oh, I'm connecting the dots. I'm connecting the, the gospel dots. You know, that 
God said he would send David. God promised an eternal David to shepherd the people. And Jesus stands in front of people in his day and says, I'm the good shepherd. I'm, I'm it. I'm the fulfillment. I am the good shepherd. And Jesus shows that he's... See, and we teach our kids how much we need Jesus, how much we need the good shepherd. And so you can use a psalm like that as kind of a, and it's not the only psalm. I said I almost picked Psalm 145. You can pick psalms and you approach them deliberately in our case of saying, how does this shape my understanding of the gospel? And how does this shape my parenting, my grandparenting? These psalms that talk about influencing the coming generations, how how can I take the word of God, Asaph called it in his day, a testimony, a law. How can I take the word of God and apply it to my kids, my grandkids, someday my great-grandkids? How can I point them to Christ? How can I show them how gracious God is, how great God is? How can I show them that we're sinners in need of his grace? And how can I show them how we can be right with God through Jesus Christ and what he did on our behalf through his life, his death, his resurrection? And so... We, we, we have this atmosphere. What I want to do in the time we have left is I want to get real practical here. Um, how, do we, how do we do this? We're talking tonight about declaring the gospel. So we're primarily thinking about words. Tomorrow night we'll talk about our lives, demonstrating the gospel. But I want to just encourage those of you that have kids at home, the primacy of parents and discipling their kids. When I was writing the book, Grandparenting with Grace, the editor, senior editor, and I, she's a good editor, good team to work with, New Growth Press. But she didn't like my word choice. We went back and forth, and she won. <laughs> but in my original draft, I talked this about parents being primary disciplers of their kids. And I said, I, I really like that phrase, primary disciplers. And she goes, well, that, that's not really a word. Uh, and uh, so we ended up calling them mentors or something like that. But now that the book's done, I can go back to say that again, can't I? <laughs> so I'm going to call you who are raising kids right now primary disciples. That if you think about discipling your kids in the ways of Christ, I want to disciple my kids in the way of Christ. You have primary role as parents. And those of us that raised kids, we had that primary role. Um, and I think you folks here at Trinity Baptist, you've been well taught. Um, but a lot of Christians have this mindset. They'll go to the youth pastor and say, my kid's really struggling. Get them straightened out. You know, you need to get my kid straightened out. My kid's struggling. What, why did we hire a youth pastor? The youth pastor needs to get my kid straightened out. You know, and you think that way, or the pastors or, uh, you know, um, Sunday school teachers or Christian school teachers and praise God for all those people. I mean, our kids grew up going to Sunday school. They all went to Christian school. I mean, we thank God for the godly influences in our kids' lives as they were growing up. Don't regret that at all. But those people are not primary. The, the youth pastor, the Sunday school teachers, the church's pastors, Christian school teachers, they're a support team. They're not primary. Parents, parents. You are the primary disciples of your kids. Don't, don't try to pass that responsibility off to somebody else. So if we're talking about declaring the gospel, speaking words, speaking the word of God, speaking the word of the gospel to our kids. How do you do that? By the way, it's both moms and dads. Um, Proverbs talk about, son, don't ignore your mother's instruction. Mothers are definitely involved. But I think in our era, I, I want to say more loudly, dad, step up. Or if I can be blunt, man up, by the grace of God, man up and disciple your kids. Declare the word of God to your kids. <clears throat> I'll tell you what. I was so blessed not too long ago. We were in Michigan visiting our older daughter and her husband. They have four kids. And, um, you know, when the grandkids come and stay over at Papa and Grandma's, I usually lead in family devotions, whatever. But here we were. We were in their home. They weren't in our home. We were in their home. My son-in-law, kids all gather around, and he's teaching the Word of God at breakfast. He did it again at bedtime. 
They're like, thank you, Lord. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, Lord. But it was my son-in-law. And he, with my daughter's help, his wife's help, is discipling his four kids. And I just am so blessed that I told him that, Josh, I am so blessed to see how you're discipling your kids. It's very intentional. And he's taking the lead as the man of the house, as the father. Ephesians 6, 4 says fathers, you know, it says bring them up in the admonition and nurture of the Lord. And people say, well, couldn't that Greek word be translated parents? Yeah, it could be, but it's usually not. It usually means fathers. And so for dads to say, I want to be the primary disciple. I appreciate so much my wife's help. She's a godly woman. She has a huge impact. But I don't want to. I, I don't. I don't want to wimp out on this as a man. I, I want to be intentional in discipling my kids in the gospel. By the way, today is January the first. What? What an opportunity to get a fresh start. If you say, "Well, I just haven't been doing this. Why? Why not get started? You got a new year right in front of you right now." Oh, what an opportunity to, to, to teach your kids this way. But I'll circle back around to this in a minute. But I want to interject something since so many of us here are grandparents. As grandparents, we are support team, but we are quite intentional support team. I don't laugh anymore when grandparents tell me, best thing of being a grandparent is get the kids sugared up and send them home. It's like, why, why would you say that? Why, why, would, why would you think that? That's the best part of grandparenting? That, you're aiming way too low. You're, you're, aiming, you're aiming way too low. Do you think the best part is sugaring them up and sending them home? You're a Christian man. You're a Christian woman, a Christian grandfather, a Christian grandmother. And that's the best you can do? I mean, as grandparents, look at look at the wall to your left. One generation, that, that's us grandparents, so, and not just us, but it's us. One generation shall so praise your works to another, declare the mighty acts of God. So as grandparents, what did we read in Psalm 78? Psalm 71, 18, Lord, don't let me die until I've declared, declared your ways to the next generation. You can see all these psalms. Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy chapter 4 talks about teach these things to your son and your son's son. So we grandfathers, we are to teach the word of God to our kids and their kids. Same thing in chapter 6, Deuteronomy 6. You see this pattern all through the Old Testament, how grandfathers and grandmothers were not sitting on the sidelines passively, uninvolved, uh, it's not my job to teach the kids God's ways. That's the parent's job. It is the parent's job, and it's also the grandparent's job. Um, my friend Josh Mulvihill wrote a wonderful book called Biblical Grandparenting. Josh says, everybody's awake. <laughs> Josh says, grandparents have a different role than the parents, but the same goal. That's memorable. We have different roles. We have the same goal. And you know what the goal is? Psalm 78, verse 7, it says, that they might set their hope in God. That's our prayerful goal. We can't make that happen. God's sovereign. He's the one who changes hearts. But we sure can pour the gospel on. We sure can talk about it, live it, that um, our desire is to see the grandkids. And you know what? I'm, I'm way off my notes here. We pray this way in front of our grandkids, too. Lord, give them a new heart. did it the other day with one of our grandkids, you know, uh, really struggling. Lord, please give Kamali a new heart. Um, help her to see you, to see your beauty, to see your grace, to see your glory in the face of your son. And she hears Papa and Grandma praying in her presence for her heart. Lord, give her a new heart. And to grow up, for the grandkids to grow up with their parents and with their grandparents, hearing them talk that way, praying that way, uh, that I'm a sinner in need of God's grace. And you know what? Christ is more beautiful than anything this world has. And you see the Lord just taking that child's heart, pulling them toward him, 
pulling them toward his son. Anyway, grandparents, we have an active role, an intentional role in pouring the gospel into our grandkids. And so um, I don't have time tonight to talk a lot about it, but if you don't want to buy the grandparenting book I wrote, you can flip through it. Just don't get a two-finger printed. Someone else might want it. But I give ideas there on how you do that. Uh, that you can, uh, even if your grandkids live a distance away, some of us talking about this before we got started tonight, four of our grandkids live in Michigan, we live in Indiana. But two of the grandkids, a 10-year-old and an 8-year-old, Gladian and I have a Bible, weekly Bible study with those two on Tuesday afternoons. We do a video call, and they have a copy of the Bible study at their house. We have one at our house, and, and we do a Bible study with them. We pray with them. We share heartfelt prayer requests. Um, pray for Papa this week. I've not been patient, and I need to see God's grace in my life that I'd be more patient. Okay, Papa, I'll pray for you that way. You know, how can I pray for you, Katie? I haven't been getting along with my mom. Okay, what's going on, Katie? How can we pray for you? You know, and you, you, the point I'm making here is that this isn't a one-time thing. This is a culture you develop over time. That we're gospel-centered as a fa extended family. We talk about these things. We care about these things. We pray about these things. This is, this is a gospel-centered atmosphere that we live as a family. So the kids grow up understanding I'm a sinner in need of God's grace, and God is gracious of what he's done. We're teaching him the word of God. So, so parents and grandparents both have important responsibilities to pour the gospel into the coming generations. How do you do that? Let's just take a little bit of time here. Deuteronomy 6. If you want to turn there, you can. If you remember that passage, uh, it's, it's a good, this is a good uh, pattern, a good paradigm here as Moses was preparing the younger generation now. He said, um, verse 4, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your might. These words that I command you today shall be on your heart. That's important. You shall teach them diligently to your children. Talk about them when you sit in the house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down, when you rise. Let me just stop right there. Do you, do you see what Paul's, excuse me, do you see what Moses is teaching the children of Israel? Talk about God all the time. Talk about, we would say, talk about the Word of God. Talk about the Gospel wherever you go. We don't do a lot of walking, but we spend a lot of time riding in the car, don't we? <laughs> what do you talk about when you're in the car? <laughs> what do you talk about when you're at home? You know, that's the point. Just it's spontaneous, but it's intentional. Those, those aren't antithetical. It's spontaneous. We hadn't pre-planned all this, but it is intentional in the sense that we're very intentionally living this way. And so my wife, I wish she were here because she is, she is my example in so many ways. But um, three of our grandkids live just a mile from us, and they all go to a Christian school. But one or two days a week, our daughter teaches piano lessons in her home, so kids get off school, and she still has another two or three lessons before, you know, uh, for the day. And so, rather than having her little kids running around while she's trying to teach piano in the living room, we'll say, "Well, my wife or I will go pick them up at school and bring them to our house for an hour and a half, and then my son-in-law or daughter comes and picks them up." So we get, you know, this hour and a half. It's pretty unstructured normally, but my wife's really good. She said, "You want a snack?" Have you ever heard a child say no? Um, <laughs> of course they want a snack. <laughs> Can we make hot chocolate? Can we have marshmallows? You know, whatever. But my wife's so good. She'll sit around the kitchen table drinking hot chocolate with these three kids, this four-year-old and a 10-year-old and a 12-year-old. And um, she'll just ask open questions. One of her favorite is, what was one of your blessings today? How did you see God at work in your class today, in your life today. That's one of the blessings you saw today. And she's trying to train the grandkids to think that way. She goes through your days, that was a blessing. I was all nervous about the spelling test and God let me remember. Or I was able to help this kid on the playground that got hurt on the swings. 
you know, well, that was a blessing that I was there and I could help. You know, what was one of the blessings today? And then you know what she asks? What was one of your challenges today? And, and so she gets the kids thinking that life isn't always easy. What's one of the challenges? Okay, how might God help in that situation, that challenge? And so, you know, the kids, the kids are learning. I mean, we've been doing this for years. So they're kind of growing up with this mindset of always keeping their eyes open for the hand of God. Am I seeing blessings from God? Am I seeing challenges? How does God's word apply in that challenge or that challenge, you know? But as grandparents, we can... We can be intentional and yet spontaneous. Um, a child gets hurt. You know, can we pray right now? This is a fallen world, isn't it? And sometimes we get hurt. Oh, don't we long for the day for Jesus to come back? He's going to wipe all the tears from our eyes. Why don't we pray while we wait for that day and ask God to fill your boo-boo? Yeah, <laughs> whatever. But it could be a little thing. It could be a big thing. Kids not getting along with their siblings. I've heard that happen sometimes. Um, you know, uh, the, the teenage drama years, you know, sweetheart, I hear your heart. That's really hard, isn't it? And the gospel shaping you as a mom or as a dad. Um, so you're not overreacting. Your confidence in God and this gospel shaping you and your words. And, uh, we all blow it at times, you know, but normally shaping those words and you know, honey, I can tell it's really hard for you. How do you think God might help us in this situation? What, do, what should we be asking him? And you're taking them vertical. You're going vertical with your teenagers. Saying, yeah, you're not minimizing their pain, but you're maximizing God's grace. Um, so often as parents or even grandparents, we try to minimize the pain. Well, that's no big deal. Buck up. We say that to the boys, buck up. We don't say that to the girls. At least not twice. <laughs> you know? But we don't minimize their pain, but we maximize God's grace. So we hear the pain, try to sympathize with that, and then we take them vertical. How might God's grace, how might God's gospel help that way? So when we're talking about declaring the gospel, I don't want you to feel like I have to have a theological education to do that. No. How has God's gospel impacted you? How could you do very similarly in talking to your kids and grandkids that way? That just in life, just in life, they're going through life and they see challenges. They see blessings and you're applying the gospel in those situations. You're answering questions, taking them vertical. But there are also planned times. And I don't think we need to say one or the other. I strongly believe there's such benefit in both. Uh, that we have planned times of instructing the kids or the grandkids as well as spontaneous times. Um, when our kids are growing up, we call it a family devotions. You might call it something else. Um, Don Whitney, some of you probably read some of Don's stuff. He's Southern Baptist Seminary professor. Uh, Don wrote a little booklet. We're, we're going to take a whole group of parents from our church through it starting in March. Um, it's just called Family Worship. This little book. And we have a lot of young parents in our church who did not grow up in Christian homes. I would guess a majority of the young parents at our church did not grow up in Christian homes. So you say, you know what, you should be, you should be um, teaching your kids very deliberately the word of God. And I say, uh, how do I do that? Well, as a church, we want to show them how. So we're trying to think of how can we train the parents and how to train their kids. How can we disciple the parents to disciple their kids? And so we're going to have a whole, I think it's going to be like 10 weeks. And uh, this is what we're going to try. This is all formative right now. We haven't done it yet. But we want to use Don Whitney's book on family worship, but then have a devotional book that everyone in the class is using simultaneously. And we're thinking about using one of Marty Michalski's books. Um, Marty wrote some wonderful books. Parents and grandparents, you want something to read for your kids and grandkids, look for Marty's books, New Growth Press, Marty Michalski. He wrote a book on the Old Testament called Long Story Short, and then he wrote a book on the New Testament called something similar. He wrote a theology for kids called Theology. <laughs> he's a good writer, and he's very biblical, very gospel-centered. Love his writings. He's, just a, he's a pastor in eastern Pennsylvania. Love the guy. Um, 
Anyway, we want to train parents. So if you feel like no one ever showed me how to do that, I don't know how, please don't despair. Uh, do what you can. And I told parents, find an age-appropriate Bible storybook. Um, there are wonderful books available now that were not available a generation ago when we were raising our kids. Some of Sally Lloyd-Jones's books. Um, mention Marty's books. Um, there are other ones out there. Some of you have a favorite family devotional book you use? Seen? I think she's related somehow. Yeah, yeah. It is good. It's a good book. Uh, Bible story book or something like that. Yeah. Yeah. Sally Lloyd Jones. Sally Michaels, who lives in Indianapolis, she's done some stuff. Anyway, look for things that are age appropriate. If you have little kids or you have grandkids that are quite young, you want something that's just real simple. They get a little older. What we did with our kids growing up is I would read. We didn't have as much back then as what's available today, but I tried to find good, solid biblical stuff that would be on their age level. Now, our kids, the youngest, oldest, is only five years. But still, five years can be a big difference. So, um, you know, that's a challenge, trying to apply it to a three-year-old and an eight-year-old at the same time. But it can be done. Um, but then as they got older, we were wanting our kids to learn to read the Bible on their own. So what we did when they got to about junior high age is we got them each a one-year Bible. And then my wife and I had one-year Bibles, and we all read the same thing individually. So today's reading was, and then over a meal we'd talk about it. So, hey, what do you think about that passage in, you know, whatever, Matthew 12 this morning, you know? Uh, did you see this, or what do you think about that? And we would just kind of informally discuss what each of us had read in our Bibles, but we were trying to train them while they were still under our roof to read the Bible on their own and learn how to process it. And we're doing that now with grandkids. Katie uh, is 10. She reads at a very high level for a 10-year-old, um, but she just finished a Bible study. And I told her last week, I said, uh, she was at our house for Christmas. I said, Katie, you finished, and we want to honor you for finishing this two-year Bible study. But do you know why Papa and Grandma wanted to do that with you? We wanted you to learn to value God's Word and to read it even without us, because we won't always be around. So we want you to keep going, even if we're not doing our video calls every week. Um, so you want your kids to learn the Word of God and to love the Word of God. Um, so I think one of the ways you can do that is to teach it to them with delight, that you're finding delight. And um, you know, if you feel like, I'm not that familiar with the Bible, what I encourage people to do <coughs> is you don't have to have a big library at home. I mean, books are great, but you don't have to have a big library. I tell people, have a good study Bible. I love the ESV study Bible. It's a really good, you know, I heard I hear people slamming it, but it's good. The NIV study Bible. Don Carson helped do the notes for that one. Um, NIV study Bible, the ESV study Bible. There's some great study Bibles out there. If you have a couple of those and you, you, your kids or grandkids say, well, what about this? What's that mean? You say, I don't know. Well, look at the footnote. Maybe it'll help. <laughs> say, well, this footnote, that's not the word of God. It's a footnote. But you say, well, this footnote says what that means is this, that Zoan was, you know, the city in Egypt. And that's where the Israelites live. I didn't know that before, but that footnote taught me that. And you help the kids say, oh, well, there's a way to learn. You know, I, can, I don't need to get stuck. But, you know, we're talking about Parenting and grandparenting, declaring the word of God, in particular, declaring the gospel. We're all involved with that. Dads, especially, primary disciples. The mothers are disciples, by the way. Ladies, what did Paul tell Timothy and when he wrote to him, 1 Timothy? He said, this faith that lives in you first lived in your grandmother Lois and then your mother Eunice. And he reminds Timothy your mom and your grandma, apparently Timothy did not have a Christian dad. Um, he had a Greek dad, but his mom and grandma were believers. And Paul commended mom and grandma to Timothy. He says, remember what you learned from your mom and your grandma? And then you get to chapter 3, and he says, remember those from whom you learned it. And he doesn't just say, remember the content. He says, remember those from whom you've learned it. Don't 
don't re don't neglect thanking God for your mother and your grandmother because they taught you the word of God. And so, ladies, you're very involved that way. But I do want us men to man up and to see our responsibility that way as fathers and as grandfathers. As grandfathers, do we want to teach our grandkids how to fish or how to snow ski or whatever? Sure. I mean, that's good stuff. Love doing that kind of stuff with grandkids. But that's not the best part of grandparenting. The best part of grandparenting is sharing the gospel with them for all of life, not just to get saved, for all of life. That they're growing up around us, whether it's just now and then or all the time as grandparents, but we're coming alongside the parents, teaching grandkids the word of God, modeling it. We'll talk about demonstrating the gospel tomorrow night. Thanks for letting me do more free reign teaching tonight. We didn't really follow the outline that much. We just have a couple minutes. Closing comments or questions? <laughs> I want you to know if you're saying, I want to be more intentional as a parent. I want to be more intentional as a grandparent. Get help. If you're saying, I don't know what to do, don't, don't do nothing. Uh, get started with something. Talk to your pastors. I'm here for a couple of days. I'm glad to you know, encourage you to do things that way. But huge blessing for the kids and grandkids, even if they're not converted yet to be exposed to the gospel, to see Christ as more valuable than anything, anyone. I often think of 2 Corinthians 4, where Paul said that God shone the light into our darkened soul so that we would see the beauty of God, the glory of God in the face of Christ. And that's how I pray for our grandkids, that they, Lord, let them see your glory in the face of your Son. That they would see Christ as beautiful. And when this world starts pulling on them, I go, well, it's nothing. I have Christ. I have Christ. You know, I, I want them to grow up feeling that, saying that. Thanks so much, friends. Let me pray for you. And some of you have to go get kids, I assume. Lord, thank you so much for your word. Thank you for your son, Jesus Christ. Thank you for your grace, your gospel. Lord, help us as we think about declaring the gospel to the coming generations, that you would give us faith, hope, encouragement, uh, Lord, that we would find delight in doing that. And that in your kindness, in your grace, Lord, we would see the coming generations set their hope in you.